This episode of Epicenter is brought to you by Cosmos. Cosmos is building the Internet of Blockchains, an ecosystem where thousands of blockchains can interoperate, creating the foundation for a new token economy. If you have an idea for a dApp, visit cosmos.network slash epicenter to learn more and to get in touch with the Cosmos team. And by TopTal. Experience a new way of hiring as TopTal delivers only the top 3% of applicants, including highly skilled blockchain engineers. If you're looking to scale your team with the very best talent, visit TopTal.com slash Epicenter. Hi, welcome to Epicenter. My name is Sebastian Couture. And my name is Brian Fabian Crane. So today we have an interview with Ben Gertzel, who is the CEO of SingularityNet. He also uh, works for a company called Hanson Robotics. You may have seen in the news, and so Hanson Robotics makes this uh, robot, uh, this kind of humanoid robot named Sophia. She's been featured in, uh, you know, on TV shows in Silicon Valley, the sitcom, and and sort of has become an ambassador for robotics. And so Ben is an expert in in artificial intelligence and robotics. And SingularityNet is a company that is building a sort of a marketplace for AI uh, on on a blockchain. So we talked to Ben about all kinds of interesting topics that we don't usually get a chance to, to discuss on the show since we pr- primarily uh, focus on blockchain. But talking about AI in a more general sense and what the future is there and then sort of how that ties into blockchain was a really fascinating conversation. And, and, and Ben is, is, a, is a great uh, speaker on these topics and does a lot of you know, thinking um, at a high level. So it was really fascinating to get to interview him. Uh, but first, we got a couple of announcements. So one uh, one thing we should mention is that we're going to be at least I, I will be at ETCC on the week of March fourth. So there's uh, Paris Blockchain Week happening in Paris that whole week, and so I'll be at ETCC. We'll also be having a meetup, and the meetup is on March sixth, so on the Wednesday around six o'clock. It's just going to be a casual, you know, get together, drinks meetup. Uh, venue isn't totally figured out yet, but it'll be announced soon. And uh, hope, yeah, hope to see you there. It's going to be, uh, I'll be there. Sunny might be there as well. And you know, we'll have some, some guests uh, and other listeners. So happy, happy to have you. We'd happy to have you join us for that meetup. And you can sign up and register at epicenter.rocks slash ECC. So that's epicenter.rocks slash ECC. If you register there, we'll send you the address uh, for the venue when, uh, when it's announced. And Brian, I think you had a, an update on Chorus One. Yeah, but first of all, that sounds great. I'm so jealous. I wish I could be in Paris too. I think um, it's going to be a really great conference. I mean, the first one that they had a couple of years ago, where we were there together, it was terrific. And I wasn't there for the subsequent ones, but it's now grown to. Uh, the organizers have told me they're waiting for. They're uh, hoping to have 1,500 people there. It's going to be at the Canam, which is this really fantastic venue, and. Um, yeah, 300 speakers. So it's 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 turning out to be quite a quite a huge conference. Cool, fantastic. But yeah, so I did want to give a brief update on Chorus One. So you know, as as many listeners know, most listeners know. So we've been Meher and I started this company together just over a year ago to work on kind of building validators for proof of stake networks, and uh, and finally now we are live on the first network, which is a project called Loom. So it's an Ethereum sidechain sort of a plasma cash chain. You know, we did, we did an interview on this before as well. Uh, and uh, it's using Tendermint as consensus. So we just launched there last Friday. And so, you know, anyone who has Loom can delegate to us. We also wrote this in-depth kind of research report on Loom. So if people want to check that out, uh, that's also available. And we'll, I will put a link to uh, our website in, in the show notes so people can find everything there. And then uh, Cosmos uh, is also about to go live, so which is also something where we'll have a, a validator on. And, and that brings us to the other thing we wanted to speak about, which is, uh, first of all, we, we have uh, Cosmos is starting to sponsor Epicenter, so that's very exciting, and is starting to do so with this episode. Now, we do need to make a disclaimer here, which is that, first of all, I have some atoms, and Sebastian has some atoms too, uh, Sunny has atoms, and uh, Meher has atoms too, right? So the Epicenter team is, is fairly uh, heavily, uh, you know, has, has some atom positions. And uh, in addition to that, of course, Sunny works for the Cosmos team, 
and I used to work for the Cosmos team, and then Meher and I have also been building a, a Cosmos validator. So we just wanted to give that disclaimer up front so people know that and fully aware of that. And, uh, and that ties into a larger topic, which we've had a bunch of discussions about, but we haven't really taken the necessary action on, and it's long, long overdue for us to do that, which is to have a, a better way of uh, disclosing uh, those kind of things. So what we will start doing, uh, and we'll probably have that up within the next week or so, uh, is it's just a page on our website where you know you you'll be able to see all of the hosts and and they will list all of the tokens uh, or you know o other kind of uh, investments they have in in the blockchain space. Uh, and then I think the other thing uh, we'll start doing is maybe in the show notes for every episode. I mean, this is something we have been doing generally. Like, let's say there's an episode and like somebody has uh, this token, then we've generally been uh, mentioning that, probably with the exception of Bitcoin and Ethereum episodes. Uh, but uh, but uh, we, we just want to be more consistent there, really make sure we mention it every time and also write it in the show notes so that I think that's mentioned. The fact that we hold atoms, I guess, at least for me, I mean, I've always been interested in Cosmos and I'm actually generally quite excited that they're launching. And so having them become a sponsor just felt like a really natural fit. Uh, and so I think you'll see in the ad that you know, their intention to, to sponsor the show is, is sort of a, a, a benefit for both. Uh, one, because we really think that Cosmos is a great platform and that you know, people should generally have interest in. And also the Cosmos team has always been very closely, we're, we've always been very close to that team and have always sort of appreciate what we've done. And you know, Jay was one of our early guests, and sort of things. Yeah, so that, I think we've set enough on that and uh, we'll, we'll have that page on our website uh, within, within about a week or so. And, and uh, we'll make a point of also mentioning in the show notes, as you mentioned. So without further delay, here's our interview with Ben Gertzel. Hi, so we're here with Ben Gertzel, and Ben is the founder and CEO of Singularity Net. He's also the chief scientist at Hansen Robotics and uh, holds a number of positions in uh, other organizations, but we'll get to that in uh, today's interview with Ben. So hi, Ben. Thanks for joining us. Hey, it's a pleasure to be here. Well, thank you for joining us. So uh, yeah, you have a very impressive resume. So as I mentioned, uh, you're the uh, founder and CEO of, of Singularity Net. You're also chief scientist at Hansen Robotics. You have a PhD in mathematics. Uh, you've started a whole bunch of companies in lots of different areas, and you're involved in some nonprofits and foundations as well. So, how how did you how did you get here, and what uh, what does your trajectory look like, and how did you get involved in AI and robotics? I've been interested in AI, robotics, uh, life extension, nanotech, femtotech, time travel. All these things since uh, you know the early 1970s when I when I was a, a little kid reading science fiction books and you know now a few decades have passed and I find myself in a world where many of these apparently science fictional technologies are are gradually becoming realities and so it, it's really really exciting to me to actually be every day you know concretely working on building thinking machines and networking people and computers together into a into a global brain and applying ai to longevity and nanotechnology it's it's astounding that we live in a time when these things are are realities and of course it's also a bit scary and sobering at times because these things could go badly wrong or or they could go amazingly right and you know uh, I've been involved in a lot of different aspects of all these technologies, many of which are converging together now. So I did a PhD in in mathematics, but even at that time, I was very interested in AI, biotechnology, and a bunch of other things. I just figured mathematics, you know, as Bitcoin says, in math we trust, right? Mathematics underlie, underlies everything. That's the foundation of all modern science and technology. So I, I figured learning a bunch of math couldn't be bad, but since shortly after getting my PhD, I've been really, which was 89, I got my degree. I mean, since then, I've been working on AI in 
in various dimensions and aspects. And now, you know, in the last few years, that's really taken off along with a bunch of other other technologies. And of course, blockchain and cryptocurrency, which you guys know a lot about, is, is all part of the mix. So right now, there's a insane number of different advanced technologies for manipulating, creating different kinds of information that are all, you know, intersecting and and, and pushing each other forward. And you could talk about these for hundreds of hours without exhausting it all. Yeah, that's definitely true. So let's, let's spend a little bit of time first on the topic of AI, which is something that I think, you know, we've tangentially talked about a bunch of times, but still it's I guess like like probably for many outside of blockchain space, there's you know a big scary term that's a little bit hard to kind of demystify. So how how do you define AI? And what's the difference between AI and you know terms that people use like machine learning and deep learning? I don't think any of these terms are worth too much in in, in the end. I mean AI, I mean in what sense is it really artificial? It's all, it's all part of nature. And to some extent, these systems are evolving and emerging instead of being purely artificially created. And intelligence, we don't even have a good definition for among humans. Like there's not an IQ test that works across different cultures or ages of people, let alone across different kinds of, of minds. So none of these are very rigorous terms. I mean, machine learning, again, in essence, all AI really is about machines that learn and, and, and reason and think. That term has lately come to be used to describe particular types of AI algorithms that are trained on, on large amounts of, of data, but then the term is also used more loosely. So, you know, is reinforcement learning a kind of machine learning or not? It's, it's not especially, it's not especially well-defined. And I mean, deep, deep learning, again, in cognitive science, you know, a guy named Stellan Olson wrote a book on deep learning, what, 15 years ago, which encompassed neural networks, logic systems, production systems, many kinds of AI algorithms. But now, now the term seems to be used for what used to be called multi-layer perceptrons, multi-layer neural networks, which is really only one special kind of deep learning system in the, in the broader sense. So, I mean, what... What deep learning originally meant was any system that just does hierarchical pattern recognition, like recognizes patterns within patterns within patterns within patterns in the world and uses those to take some action. The deep learning systems being talked about mostly now are hierarchical neural networks, which is one special kind of deep learning system in the broader case. So, I mean, what, what we have is a lot of words with confusing definitions that, that, that shift over time and don't necessarily mean what they sound like they mean, which, which comes back to in math we trust, right? Because the, the thing is the algorithms are, do, are doing what they're doing and they're, they're, there's a real mathematical description to them which, and they carry out practical functions. But the, the buzzwords associated with them serve mostly to, to sell things rather than to convey useful information. Okay, okay. That is helpful, but then let's speak about one term, and, and I think that's a term that maybe you do have more of a relationship to, which is uh, AGI, so Artificial General Intelligence. Yeah, well, let, 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 me, let me try to go to what I think are the foundations here, because I mean, they're... It is possible to describe these things in a way that, that makes sense. It, it's just that, that things become marketing buzzwords and then, then, and then, then become, become confusing. So I, I think fundamentally you can think about a mind or an intelligent system as something that's recognizing patterns in itself and in the world around it. And then that system may have some goals, which doesn't mean everything it does is goal-directed, but it may have some goals. And it, it then recognizes patterns regarding which actions will achieve which goals in, in which contexts, right? So you have a pattern recognition system, and it has goals, among other dynamics, and it's trying to learn, it's trying to recognize patterns of how to achieve what goals in what situations. And, you know, ba babies do that, right? Babies are recognizing patterns in the world around them all the time. 
and they have some goals, like they want to get some milk, some food, they, they want to run around, and they try to figure out what patterns of activity will let them achieve their goals in what, in what situations. And then where, I mean, where deep learning comes in is the world we live in seems to be made largely of hierarchically composed patterns, where you have patterns that build up into more complex ones, build up into more complex ones. I mean, just like Physics builds into chemistry, builds into biology, builds into psychology, builds into sociology. So we have hierarchically composed patterns, which means if you have a learning engine that is trying to recognize patterns in a hierarchy, it may well succeed because our, our world seems to, be, seems to be built that way. Now, it happens that most of the AIs out there in the world now are able to recognize patterns in a very narrowly defined context and to achieve only a very narrow set of goals. Like, say, the, the original AlphaGo could recognize patterns in Go games and it could achieve the goal of winning a Go game, right? And that was it. Now, AlphaZero was a step beyond that. These programs are all by Google DeepMind, which is one of the more interesting AI organizations out there. Alpha Zero went beyond that because it can play a lot of different kinds of board games. So it can recognize patterns in a broader scope of environments in many, many different types of board games. And it can achieve more types of goals because the ways of winning chess or Go or, or Shogi or whatever are, 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 are different, right? It's still not nearly as general as a human being, though, because we can not only play board games, but we can recognize patterns in a huge number of other kinds of environments. And we can achieve many, many different types of goals. You know, like we can prove math theorems, we can blow people up, we can, we can chase girls, we can, we can make art, we can try to save starving kids. There's a lot of goals we can work toward in a fairly rich collection of environments. But we're still not like infinitely general intelligences. You could, you could imagine a mind that could recognize patterns in 407 dimensional space. We're very bad at that, right? We're much better at like two, three or four dimensions. So we're, we're still somewhat restricted. We're good at recognizing patterns in some kinds of environments and achieving some kinds of goals, better than Alpha Zero or existing AI programs. But you could imagine some kind of mind that could recognize patterns in like a space of any dimensions and in, in things that just look like noise to human beings and that could achieve goals that humans can't even begin to, begin to understand. So I think... You know, totally general intelligence that could recognize any kind of pattern in any kind of world and could figure out how to achieve any kind of goal by recognizing patterns of how to achieve that goal. That's probably not achievable in this physical universe, like a totally general intelligence. But we're much more general than any existing AI program. Like each of us can deal with a lot of different problems. And if you give us something totally new to deal with, like, the internet didn't exist when I was born, let alone when, when the, you know, my DNA evolved. It didn't exist when I went to school. But I, like everyone else, was able to adapt to deal with this new thing, right? We don't yet have AIs that can transfer the knowledge and adapt to deal with some very new type of thing that they weren't programmed or, or trained for, right? And I, th I, think, I think we will, but we're not there yet. So I think now the AI field is starting to begin a transition from narrow AIs that do highly specific things, recognize patterns and achieve goals in very specific domains, toward more general AIs that can just deal with a broader scope of knowledge and a broader variety of goals and can transfer what they've learned so far to very different conditions. And I mean, this will be really important. You see that with like self-driving cars now are crashing into people because they're seeing situations that weren't in their training data. I mean, that's a failure to, a failure to generalize, right? And in, in financial markets, when you have what's called a regime change, oh, suddenly the market's acting totally different than it was acting before. Well, again, current quantitative financial prediction systems and risk management systems, they failed to generalize, right? They, they were trained on previous market regimes. When you give them a new market regime, you know, they, they're still acting on their, on their previous knowledge. Now, of course, most people can't deal with a new market regime either, but at least in, foundationally, we do have the ability to like go back to basics and deal with the 
radically new new situation and that's that's a big a big challenge facing the AI field in 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 the next phase which i think uh we're going to meet but it's a, there's still some research challenges there that's interesting I, i've never considered that way that you know i guess that like humans and carbon based beings are good at recognizing certain types of patterns and i guess you could maybe differentiate so like humans are good at at cer recognizing certain pa types of patterns and acting on them and that might be different from like for instance the intelligence of a dolphin or another type of carbon based yeah. being and then artificial or computer based intelligence or, or like silicon based intelligence might be good at recognizing patterns and like you said like you know, multiple hundreds of dimensions and figuring out you know actions based on on, on what what sees there in those patterns. Yeah, this gets, it gets kind of subtle if you think about it because like I mean we we evolved in this domain of like discrete solid objects like bouncing off each other and so on right and th this probably led us to ideas about causation but if, if you're a dolphin in the water you are seeing things flow around and blend into each other you're not seeing so many solid objects bouncing off each other that probably leads to a quite different world view now also like where each of our minds is stuck in an individual body for like our entire life until we die, right? And I mean, in, in barring our reincarnation and other other freaky things, at least to to a first degree of approximation, right? Now, if you're an AI that can port yourself between different bodies or occupy a hundred different bodies at a time, or like fork yourself and or ro roll back to your last version before a traumatic experience, like a, how does that change? Your whole outlook, what kind of patterns you look for, what goals you, you bother to achieve, what risks you're willing to take, right? I mean, I mean, there's, yeah, there's so many ways that we're overfit to the exact environment we evolved in and, and the problems that, that we're trying to solve. And then the, the other thing to realize, like, realize is we, we're stuck without root access to our brains and bodies, which is, which is pretty terrible, right? Because, I mean, if you're an AI, you can have, like, root super user access your own brain and body. If you think, well, I don't like the way I react in this situation, just go in and fix the damn bug, right? But, but we, we can. If we want to fix bugs in ourselves, it's like years and years of uh, you know, meditation or, or therapy or reflection rather than just go in and, and change the rogue piece of code, right? So, I mean, there, there, there's a lot, of, a lot of things we take for granted now in terms of biases we have or restrictions that, 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 that we have which uh, are not really intrinsic to being an intelligent mind, but, but I, mean, I mean, they're just particularities of how we happen to evolve out of uh, apes in, in, in Africa, right? right? And, and I mean, that's, uh, in, in general, this is sort of why I like a mathematical and conceptual view of things, because how things evolved, no, there's some fundamental reality to it, but there's a lot of historical contingency. I mean, you see the same thing with exchange and, and money and so forth. I mean, people take so many things for granted about how economies work, which aren't necessarily intrinsic to the nature of like exchanging value in a community. They're, they're just how things happen to evolve for quasi-random combination of reasons. This episode of Epicenter is brought to you by Cosmos the internet of blockchains. We couldn't be more excited about the upcoming mainnet launch and to see so many projects already building on it. Blockchain technologies are evolving fast and development shouldn't be one size fits all. As a dApp developer, you need the tools that will allow your dApp to scale, grow and evolve over time. The Cosmos SDK is a user-friendly modular framework which allows you to customize your dApp to best suit your needs. It's powered by Tenement Core, an advanced implementation of the BFT proof of stake protocol. Cosmos takes care of networking and consensus and allows you to focus on building your application in your language of choice. Ethereum smart contracts will be supported soon, and the SDK makes it simple for you to connect to other blockchains in the Cosmos network. If you have an idea for a dApp and would like to learn more about the Cosmos SDK, or if you'd like to connect your existing dApp to Cosmos, visit cosmos.network epicenter. For Epicenter listeners, the Cosmos team will reach out to answer your questions and help you get started. We'd like to thank Cosmos for their support of Epicenter. So let's let's talk a bit about um, about AI and data, and 
this is a topic that has been brought a lot in the in the conversation about AI and, and the fact that AI needs large quantities of data to uh, to train itself. And we, we kind of talked about this. So you know, to, today, data is very centralized, and, and data is is held and owned by by a small number of very large companies. Do you see this as a problem? Uh, you know, I is, is there yeah, any important. type of repercussions that were aren't intended there, or is there a better system that you think we could achieve? Yeah, I mean, the situation with the collection, storage, and use of data regarding human beings on the planet now is really pretty ridiculous. I mean, it's not it's necessarily entirely bad or, or malevolent. Some of it's really good and useful, but overall, the ownership and control of data from the various centers we have everywhere is it's centralized in a, in a pretty bizarre way. I mean, some of it's good, of course, like at Google Maps, it's, it's pretty nice that it's collecting data on where everyone's driving to. So you can like see where there, where there's a traffic jam, right? So th these are, these are very, these are very useful functions. And I don't really mind sharing location anonymously of where I'm driving with Google Maps so it can tell everyone else where there's a traffic jam, right? I mean, that, that seems like a fair exchange. But I mean, in, in the end, the agency regarding use of people's data is in a very confused state. So like the, this phone I carry with me everywhere, right? There's a tremendous amount of data coming through this phone onto the internet. And it's all... In a sense, my data, right? It's data about what I'm talking about, who I'm talking to, like where I am, what I'm taking pictures of. But all this data coming from me through this device that I bought and then I pay a subscription to connect to the internet each month, like this data is going sort of haphazardly into various databases owned by various large corporations, probably passing it along to various governments along the way. And then this data is then being used, you know, for some useful things like telling me when there's when there's a traffic jam, right? And and then it's being used to advertise things to me, which doesn't matter to me much since I never I've never clicked on an ad in in in, in my life, I think. But it, I mean, it's uh, it's 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 being used by big companies to make themselves money and increase their ability to manipulate people as a whole. Like even if I don't click on their ads, by studying me along with everyone else, they're learning how to manipulate the minds of other people who do click on their ads and do read their, their fake news. So then, yeah, you got to ask like, okay, this data that comes from me through this device that I'm paying for and paying to connect to the internet, like why, why isn't there an easy way for me to observe what this data is being used for and have some agency over what this data is is being used for like if, if my data is being used you know to provide data to fuel someone's political campaign i'd rather have it be used only for a candidate i agree with or something right and you know it's quite within our reach technologically to put agency over use of our data whether for ai or for basic statistics in in the hands of the human being who produces that data on the other hand it's not in accordance with the business model of the large corporations involved in the phone and the internet services behind it, it's not in the interest of the business model of these corporations to provide that agency to the user, except insofar as like government regulators force them to. But of course, government regulators, even when well-intentioned, which is only a fraction of the time, they can't keep up with the the advances of the of, of technology. Now this, uh, I mean, this uh, right now is mostly an inconvenience and a sort of aesthetic and, and moral infelicity. But I mean, as, as we move from narrow AI toward AGI, if it turns out that these stores of data, you know, are critical for giving some parties a boost toward AGI more so than others, right? And then then this hoarding of data could actually have a have a more a more critical importance. And in, in principle, blockchain and related technologies give a way to 
circumvent these issues by putting each individual's data in some you know online repository or distributed decentralized repository which is encrypted by their private key and then giving that individual agency over how the data is used and then there are fancy tools like homomorphic encryption and multi-party computation which can can be used to you know let a person give certain aspects of their data to certain other parties to use for certain things without giving all of it away. So, in, yeah, in theory, the blockchain-based decentralized ecosystem provides the technical tools and the sort of cultural oomph to, to solve these problems. And on the other hand, the centralized ecosystem underlying, you know, big data and mobile phones and computers and embedded devices is has multiple trillion-dollar companies uh, Pushing things, pushing things forward. So there, there's a the decentralized world has the right tools, but a big challenge on their hands here. I'd love to speak a little bit about the concept of AI safety, and, and, and just to to take a step back here, I guess like you know what what are some of the fear scenarios here? Right? So so like let's say fear scenario today is okay, AI is replacing all of these jobs. So people become, you know, unemployed. Uh, maybe it, it leads to accumulation of resources with few people more and more, and you have this like extreme inequality, right? Like that's that's like one fear scenario about AI. Maybe a different one is that then this AI starts to have its own objectives, becomes more and more powerful, gets more and more resources, and its objectives maybe it's hostile to humans. Or maybe it's like indifferent to humans. And so you, you have these potentially like bad outcomes, right? In that maybe extreme inequality, maybe you just have like human beings becoming a kind of, you know, inferior species being exploited. And then, you know, this is this is feel right, like this idea of AI safety. So like what are your thoughts on it? Do you think this is an important field? Do you think efforts around AI safety are needed? People are certainly right to be thinking about AI safety and really about the impact and implications of, of AI for the advance of technology and the growth of humanity in general. Because, I mean, looking at AI separately from politics and from all the other tech connected with AI prob probably doesn't make sense. So... People are certainly right to be thinking and worrying about it. Now, whether the things that people will do about it will have a positive or negative impact is a, is a, is a, is a different question, right? Like, I mean, bioethics is, is a somewhat similar thing. And in general, it's easy to agree we should be thinking somewhat about the ethics of, you know, genetic engineering and the biohacking and so forth. Like, no. I, I don't want people to create like weird, say, artificial babies that have like a hypertrophied pain cortex. So they're just suffering and screaming with a billion times the level of suffering any normal human can have, right? So, I mean, clearly, clearly there are some things that as a society we just don't want people to bioengineer because they're, they're just plain old nasty and you're, you're just creating suffering. On the other hand, in practice, the role of most bioethicists seems to be just to say, you know, genetic engineering is, is, is bad. Don't, don't make CRISPR babies. Don't upgrade your intelligence, right? So while in, in theory, yes, there are things that are just morally bad to do by essentially any human standard, and we want to reflect on what to actually do and what not to do. Not all possible things should be done. On, on the other hand, in practice, Bioethics seems very uh, one-sidedly inclined to just push against advancing of humanity in new directions and to push against reduction of suffering in favor of maintenance of the status quo. And I would say most, most people who talk a lot about AI safety are not really thinking about how to maximize the odds of a beneficial outcome for humanity, all things considered. They more are, are, are thinking, like, how do we slow down AI development? Because we don't 
understand it and we're scared about it. So I, I find myself disagreeing with almost everyone who's putting themselves out there as an AI safety pundit. But that, that doesn't mean I don't think AI safety is important. Like I, I don't want the Terminator to be roaming, roaming the streets. Like I, I, I mean, I have four kids. I, I don't want an AI to be turning them into fuel or something, right? So, so let's, let's talk then about, about yeah. I think this ties into Hanson Robotics quite, quite well, because yeah, uh, with, with regards to Hanson Robotics, and you guys have built this, this, uh, this robot named Sophia that I'm sure most, most of our listeners have seen um, at, least, yeah. at least once on the internet, because uh, she's had quite a few media appearances. She's been on Jimmy Fallon, yeah. and, and then you know, I think it was at a bunch of different conferences. You know, what's the purpose of this robot, and how does it maybe achieve? Yeah, I think so, Sophia, uh, Sophia indeed was partly created and envisioned as sort of an ambassador, ambassador of uh, AI love and love and and compassion, and I, I, I think. Uh, that's been interesting to see because David Hansen, who, who's, who's a good friend of mine, I mean, he, I've known him for a long time. And I, I came to Hong Kong, where I'm living now in 2011, and he visited me here once. And I ended up convincing him to come here and move his company here and introducing him to some folks who helped inject funding into his company here. So we've been talking about these things a long time. And I think what's interesting is. David is really a warm, loving, good-hearted person. He wanted to create a robot that would emanate love and compassion, make people love it, so that it would, you know, build a positive relation between humans and, and robots, like proactively, even before we have human-level AGI, so that as AIs and robots get more and more generally intelligent, that positive relationship is there. On the other hand, David, he's an artist, and... As such, he can't help himself from poking people and, and, and provoking controversy uh, a little bit and making, making things a little bit creepy sometimes just because he thinks that, 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 looks, that looks coolest. So I, I, mean, I, I, I would say Sophia and all the Hanson robots, are, they're driven by David's desire to build a sort of compassionate, loving bond between human and AI and, and the robot. And, also, at some level, driven by David's uh, semi-conscious artistic desire to poke at people a little bit and make and make them a little a little uncomfortable, right? And the, these come together in an, in an interesting way, and I think that's good because you know my my emotional orientation is optimistic and 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 positive. So I mean, I, my intuition and feeling is that the technological singularity. Is going to come out awesome and closer to utopic than dystopic, but I I also think there's a fundamental uncertainty to all this. So people are are certainly justified to feel a little bit uncomfortable and, and confused. Like in in the end, none of us knows what's going to happen. We're, we're on the verge of creating machines that are, you know, ten, twenty, a hundred, a billion times more intelligent and capable than we are, and we'd be idiotic to believe we could predict in detail how this is going to is going to come out i mean i i find this irreducible uncertainty beautiful and exciting and i see it as what humanity has been doing since the beginning like this is why we're less boring than cows and sheep right i mean we we decided not to remain monkeys and we we invented language and fire and wheels and and machines and money and bitcoin and and ai and and AGI, I mean, that's the trajectory we're on. We're revolutionizing ourselves over and over, and we never know what's, we never know what's going to happen next, right? And that's, that's part of the essence of what, of what it is to totally. be human. And I, th I think David, he, he baked some of that in, into Sophia as, as, as an artist, along with the love and, and, and compassion, which is quite cool. Yeah, yeah. And, and so probably many listeners have, seen the tv show silicon valley so there is this kind of uh, uh basically inspired by by you and by sophia the part there where basically uh you know someone meant to be you is is kind of playing this role but let's move to blockchain now when did you get interested in blockchain and why did you think that blockchain had you know kind of relevance to you know the future course of ai 
Uh, I've been so I've been interested in crypto for a long time, like since the early '90s when I was doing math with finite fields and and cryptography tech, and that that seemed like it could potentially be important just politically in terms of stopping governments from having like the ability to spy on everyone's information and and keep it unique uniquely for themselves. Bitcoin. I didn't like because it just because proof of work annoyed me. It just heats up the environment and wastes energy unnecessarily. So I did I didn't get involved in that. When Ethereum came out, that's the first thing where I thought, well, this this is actually cool. Like it, it did it did use proof of work, but you could see there was a, a will and a path to going beyond that. And then you had Solidity, I mean you have a scripting language which basically lets you create this, you know, secure in, in encrypted decentralized world computer and I, I thought I thought ethereum was a vision in the right direction and it was a reasonable software tool set although obviously immature at first and not not that mature still so once ethereum came out I started really thinking like how do we use this to create like a decentralized global AI network because I in 2001, I published a book called Creating Internet Intelligence, which envisioned a, you know, a decentralized global network of AIs coming together as a society of mind. And I, before that, in, in 95, I, I posted some web pages claiming I was going to run for U.S. president on the decentralization uh, party platform, which I, I ended up not doing because I realized in time what a terrible job it would be to be president anyway. But I mean, the these ideas were interesting to me for a long time, both decentralized control politically, because I always had a sort of anarcho-socialist bent, and then the idea of making a decentralized global AI network, like Marvin Minsky's Society of Minds, but an economy of minds where the AIs are paying each other for work, and there's collective intelligence coming out of the, of the whole network beyond the intelligence and the parts. But Ethereum seemed like a critical step forward toward having a tool set that, that would let you do this. And so that then, as soon as Ethereum was there, you had the idea of, of DAOs, decentralized autonomous organizations, which, again, they'd been spelled out in science fiction, like in Charlie Strauss's book, Accelerando, and a bunch of others, but with a Solidity programming language, like, wow, you could script a DAO in a short script, right? That's that's similar feeling to how when I first learned Java in like 1995, it's like, wow, you can create a web page or send an email with this much code. That's power, right? Solidity was like that. Like you could, you could create a decentralized corporation and just a little bit of, of, of code. It's not the perfect language, just like Java wasn't. But it, I mean, it, it, really, it really opened the door. And once I saw how Ethereum worked, I started thinking, well, how do we put this together with, for example, OpenCog, which is my open source AI platform aimed at general intelligence or, you know, distributed neural networks or genetic algorithms or whatever other type of AI. It seemed clear you could use Ethereum as a basis for connecting together many different AI nodes into some sort of decentralized AI mind. And then this, logically, this should be able to kick the asses of Google, Amazon, Tencent, and the IBM and all these big companies by you know, the power of decentralized community. And then when, when I, I met Simone Giacomelli, who was later to co-found SingularityNet with me, and he had, he had a blockchain development team in Italy, and he'd been helping out a host of different blockchain projects. So when I met Simone, who was really conversant with the blockchain world, both technically and on the business level, then we sort of put our heads together, and we we like roughed out what became the singularity net design and then started moving toward the initial token sale. And then David Hansen, who already was a close friend, I mean, he, he saw the vision immediately. Our first meetings on this were in the Hansen Robotics office in, in Hong Kong. And David saw this as a way to get like a decentralized global robot mind cloud behind his robots. Because you always knew the intelligence isn't going to be in Sophia, right? I mean, some is about seeing and moving. But the cognitive parts, the long-term knowledge, are going to be in the cloud. But what cloud, right? Do you have a million robots around the world and all the intelligence is running in Amazon's cloud or it's using like Microsoft Azure API? 
or do you have like a decentralized mind cloud that's owned and controlled by all the people who are buying these robots, right? So that, that was, David was seeing it as a robot mind cloud, but it was really the same thing that Simone and I were seeing with a decentralized blockchain-based AI mind. Okay, okay. So would it be fair to kind of characterize this as, you know, you, you see this trajectory or you see this AI coming, but then the question is, yeah, where, where do those AIs coordinate? Where do they share information? What kind of substrate do they run on? And of course, if you look at it today, right, it will be mostly uh, controlled by companies like Google and Facebook. And then with something like Singularity Net, there could be, you know, kind of an open, decentralized, uh, transparent, accessible, democratic platform where, you know, AIs could coordinate, AIs could share data, AIs could evolve. That's kind of the Yeah, the vision. I, there, that's right. So, there, I mean, as I've said before, what really excited me about the Singularity Net design and vision is seeing that two different goals, which are very important, really converge into one. So one, one goal is to make sort of a, a venue for many different AI components to join forces to make a collective AI mind where the whole is greater than, than the sum of the parts. So you may have a, one AI that like uses our open cog algorithm to generalize and abstract and reason. You could have another AI that recognizes patterns in DNA data, another AI that uses deep neural nets to recognize patterns in visual data, and you connect them all together into a mind that self-organizes and adapts. So the AGI could be in the whole network, not in any one particular node in the network. And then the, the other thing is, okay, but if we're going to have this network of AIs, like who controls that, that network? Is, is it all sitting inside Google or Amazon? Or, or is it just more like the internet, right? Which is not controlled by anyone. It's a network of, of networks, which is controlled by the different participants right and so it seemed you could use blockchain to achieve both these goals to make a network of ais that's controlled by the participants in a sort of democratic self-organizing and open way and also make it so that the design encourages the ais to collaborate with the with each other and join federations with, with collective intelligence and and so forth and so this yeah, of course, it's easier said than done. But I mean, we we did the initial token sale for this December 2017. We're launching like the initial, the beta version of the platform the end of this month, uh, the, 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 the end of, of, of February, after a simple alpha was launched December 2017. And then during 2019, post the February launch of the beta, we're going to add more and more and more features to the network as well as adding more and more of our own, our own AI into the network. And, there, you know, there's a huge, the biggest part of the struggle remains in the future because, I mean, we have a beta version of the platform. We have some nice AI we've put in there, but still, you know, our competitors are, are trillion-dollar companies with humongous server, server farms. And, you know, Amazon has 10,000 people working on Alexa, right? So, so to, to counteract that, we need not only a good design and smart AI, we need to attract a developer and user community, which is even bigger and better than, than the armies of highly paid employees that these big tech companies have. And this, uh, I mean, this is one of the reasons why I'm happy to talk to, to you guys and, 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 and your audience, because get, getting a community crystallized around decentralized AI is absolutely critical to really making the decentralized AI vision happen. Hiring is stressful. Let's face it, it's a long process of sifting through resumes and interviewing candidates without any guarantee of quality. But it doesn't have to be this way. Companies all over the place are experiencing a new way of hiring with TopTal. If you go to their Trustpilot page, you'll see that of the hundreds of people that have left reviews, over 98% were four or five star ratings including one guy who wants to give his developer a bear hug. That says a lot. TopTal gets all this great feedback because they focus on their clients and their top priority is quality. They only accept the top 3% of applicants, including highly skilled blockchain engineers. One of these engineers is Radek Ostrowski. Radek has experience as a lead software engineer and data scientist for Sony and Expedia. 
Then he discovered blockchain and he became totally consumed with Ethereum. He worked as a consultant for the firm Start On Chain, and his time locked app won the top quarter consensus Uport and Identity blockchain hackathon. Then he expanded his reach through TopTal. He worked with a bunch of clients on projects such as smart contract development and a POC that leverages blockchain. If you want to hire engineers like Roddick for your team, go to toptal.com slash epicenter for a no risk trial. A TopTal director of engineering will deliver your next hire in as fast as 48 hours, and you'll get $1,000 credit when you decide to hire. We'd like to thank TopTal for their support of Epicenter. Let's go a little bit in depth on, you know, Singularity Net and what that looks like. So can you speak about, you know, what are the different kind of components of the system? And you mentioned, you know, developers getting involved. Let's say now there is some AI algorithm developer. Like how would they, how would an interaction with Singularity Net look like? Well, if you have an AI algorithm, integrating it with Singularity Net is actually not especially difficult. I mean, it's a container-based system like most cloud systems now. So you, you put your, your AI in a Docker container or LXC container, and, and, and then there's a simple API to integrate it with, which then lets, lets your AI accept payment for services in our AGI cryptographic token, lets it, and then announce what API it wants to use to get data and, and queries. And then it can give responses in, in, in JSON or in whatever API it, it wants. So it's really just, it's a system of containers. And then there's a, a payment system using a token. And I mean, for, for cases where an AI outsources work to another AI, which outsources work to another AI, there's a, I mean, there's a multi-party escrow framework on the back end. And there, there's a system that allows a lot of AI to AI transactions to occur off the blockchain for speed purposes, but all that's really behind the scenes. I mean, from the point of view of an AI developer, it's it's really pretty simple to put your AI in a container and take, I mean, 15 minutes to two or three hours to integrate integrate with the the Singularity Net wrap, wrappers. So I get that, right? So I, I put my AI algorithm into a Docker container, kind of make it accessible through Singularity Net. But let's say now I'm on the other hand, somebody, I have a bunch of data. I would love to get a better understanding of maybe what's actionable, what it means. So could I then go and basically say, you know, kind of hire the services of different of these AI algorithms to like get me results? Yeah. And... So I think the decentralized protocol could actually be used by anyone and i mean we use behind the scenes a component called drizzle which allows like decentralized search of, of any network of, of ethereum nodes so i mean you could if you are a reasonable scripter i mean you could just put out script your own query to go search the whole network and find any ai that broadcasts that's able to do the kind of thing that that you want now on the other hand we're making it easier than that. So along with the beta, we're launching just a marketplace user interface, which is a website. And you can go to that website and you can see what AI services are, are listed and, and what sorts of things they do. And you see their addresses and, 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 and so forth. So, I mean, that's uh, right now in practice, that's a bit centralized, right? Because, I mean, we make this web interface, which lists a bunch of, of AI on there and I mean we are legally liable for what we list there so we have to do some vetting of what we allow on there just like the Google Play Store does or something on the other hand the underlying protocol is completely decentralized and open so I mean for for example if like we're, we're incorporated Singularity Net Foundation which is building the Singularity Net network now is incorporated in the Netherlands so Suppose that Netherlands law said we weren't allowed to list on our user interface, you know, an AI based in uh, Iran or North Korea or something. Then we'd have to take that off our interface. On the other hand, the decentralized network is whatever it is, right? So someone, someone in Iran can build another interface, which is like an interface to all the Iranian and, and, and North Korean AI nodes on the network or something, right? Because So this is... 
the beauty of this architecture. You have this decentralized protocol, which is controlled by no one, and anyone can put an AI online, and then it just announces it's there to the other AIs in that network, and then it can be found by decentralized peer-to-peer peer-to-peer -peer interactions. So that's there, which gives a lot of robustness to it. On the other hand, for ease of use, we're, we're putting up uh, a simple website which just lists, lists the, the AIs that are, that are on there, which then can be interacted with from a customer's view, just like you're getting AI as a service from any other directory or, or, or somebody's website. Now, the, the beta still has some limitations in the sense that we accept payment in the beta only in our AGI token, which is an ERC-20 token. And one of the things we're going to do in the months after the beta is integrate the third-party you know, fiat to crypto payment system because, of course, most, most companies who want to use AI inside their, their website or their product, not from the crypto space, they, they don't want to deal with crypto wallets and so forth at, at, at this point. But this... This isn't isn't a really big obstacle. It's just something we 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 hadn't hadn't done yet. It's more a regulatory thing than a, than a hard technical problem. So you mentioned the AI AGI token. So what's the role of the token? Well, the token is used by AIs to pay other AIs for services that they provide. But having our own token economy lets us nudge the incentive mechanisms in, in an interesting way. So as well as using it for payment of one AI by another AI, we, we also will issue token bounties as, as rewards for people who contribute AIs that are requested by the community. And then we will implement later this year a curation market where if I want to rate your AI as good, one way I can do that is to stake some token on your AI. And then if your AI comes out to be rated good by a lot, a diversity of other people, I'll get some reward. Whereas if your AI turns out to be horrible, then, then I, will lose, I will lose some of, what I, some of what I staked. So having our own token, it's both an efficient, a secure and private way to do transactions. And it lets us do things with, you know, bounties for development and staking and, and curation markets, which I think can sculpt and guide the economy of AIs. And, and this, is, this is, is quite important because there's, there's something in AI and cognitive science called the assignment of credit problem, which is when, when you have a complex network of agents cooperating to do some function. I mean, how do you ensure that the agents like deep in the bowels of the network that indirectly helped achieve the function are actually getting, getting rewarded, right? And the human brain somehow does this, right? Like if you do something that gets you food or sex or money or intellectual satisfaction, whatever is good, you know, the, the neurons that moved your arms and legs don't get all the reward, right? There's reward that goes to the neurons deep in your brain that helped you get whatever those goodies were. The U.S. economy, for example, doesn't do so good a job of assigning credit internally, which is why bankers make so much more money than programmers or, or kindergarten teachers or artists or something, right? So we, and arguably the Bitcoin and Ethereum economies, although they're really cool in some ways, I mean, there's a strong tendency toward like oligopoly and oligarchy in, the, in these economies and the they don't necessarily do a brilliant job of assigning credit to genuine value either. So by making our own tokenomic economy and sculpting the reward system in it, we hope to make the economy of AIs operate better than other existing economies so that the AI is really contributing most to the overall network and its intelligence and, and the value it delivers. The AI is contributing most to the overall network are actually getting rewarded significantly. And that this is a hard problem where like economic design matches cognitive science, right? It's a, these, these are fairly subtle things. Yeah, this is, this, I want to ask you this. So it, if you take something like 
Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure if you're familiar with uh, the system, uh, the blockchain TrueBit. So it's like a distributed computation uh, blockchain. And dis distributed computation systems have been around for years. And more recently, you know, people have uh, embedded them in with blockchain systems so that you can have this reward mechanism. And so with, with TrueBit, you, you have uh, these actors at the network who watch for, uh, who, um, who can potentially validate uh, or verify the computations. And so therefore there's an incentive to those providing the computations to provide correct computations because they have a, um, uh, there's a possibility of them getting slashed if, if they don't provide accurate computations. Now this is for computations that are somewhat trivial to, uh, to achieve with like even general purpose computers. Uh, but with, with AI, if I send some task to an AI and it, it returns a result or it returns some some sort of data set, how can I as a user or even other users of the network verify that? And also I think with AI there there might even, you know, with gen like general intelligence becoming uh, you know, closer to reality, you know, AIs could have their own kind of subject subjective bias perhaps. And so sure. interpretation yeah. might be different between one AI and another. How do you test for that, and how do you verify that the result that an AI is, is providing is actually actually accurate? Yeah, I mean, there's there's clearly no general solution to that that problem, just as there isn't among humans, right? Because the AIs are going to be doing so many different so many different types of things. I mean, you could have an AI that's proving proving math theorems or coming up with science hypotheses to help with with biomedicine or or predicting the stock market or something right so then it's like is your stock prediction ai giving subtly biased predictions that it's then using to make money by trading itself in the background against what you traded or something there i mean there, there's a lot of subtleties that that could come up and they're going to be different for the different kinds of AI that that you're doing. So I, I think that if you're doing a specific type of computation for a specific type of problem, then you could come up with like a, a formalistic solution for this, right? Like if 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 you have an AI that's generating programs according to specs, you can do some like formal software verification to see that the software actually performs according to spec. And if you're if you have an AI that's analyzing DNA data, I mean if you if you have your own human DNA data, you can do out of sample testing on on, on that data to see if it's valid. But the, there's really going to be no general purpose solution. And Singularity Net is really a general purpose network. So we I mean we put a bunch of work into designing a reputation and rating system, which is sophisticated and and hard to game, and this is not part of the beta, but it will be it will be rolled out rolled out uh, later in in, in twenty nineteen. But I think that that's been like a holy grail for every online marketplace, right? And we you really need to get you really need to get that right because in the end, verification that things are accurate unbiased or not too biased or, or, or inappropriately biased. I mean, this is really hard and it's domain specific. And ultimately, each person isn't doing that on their own, right? It's like if... if, if, if well, that's if like I, kind of the point of, of delegating tasks to an AI is that you know, yeah, we can't know, do them on our own. So we're sort of trusting AI, that... But which AI do you delegate it to, to, right? So like if, if I'm... If I'm want to verify that someone's AI for analyzing DNA data is accurate, and then not many of us are going to, you know, write the code or even run the code for that ourselves. We're going to go to some service that, that does that. And then which service do we trust? Like, is it the Singularity Net Foundation certified service? Well, then that's like a centralized elite or... Or do you have a variety of you know competing services out there? Then you choose which one. So, in, but then it comes down to reputation systems again, because then then you're choosing the one that you think has the highest reputation. Maybe because it comes from Harvard University or from the the NSA or like who 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 do you, who do you trust, right? So I mean, ultimately, even when there's a formal mathematical solution there, 
you're you're placing trust in in someone right now if something is simple and generic enough you could bake verification in, into the protocol right i mean as is done as is done with uh with cryptographic checking and, and but i think checking if an ai is correct or not is just it's not going to be that simple it's going to be a variety of different algorithms for different checking different types of problems in different domains and then you need reputation system to be able to place to know which verification checker to to trust and then people will try to game game that reputation system by giving a high rating to to bogus like ver truth verification checkers right so so you need a machine learning based reputation police to to try to stomp out people gaming the reputation system and then you have to believe the machine learning based reputation police itself isn't corrupt right so I mean, I mean, this this right. is a, this is the world that we're that we're that we're in. But on the other hand, like the real world economy isn't all that clean and and safe either, right? Like, w w which major government is not is 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 not corrupt in some in some serious way? So I I don't think like the AI and blockchain economy is not creating this problem. This is a problem of human beings being assholes, right? And this is, this is just, uh, it manifests itself in everything that human beings do. Okay, so this is great. So I, I think it very much ties into another thing that, uh, you know, I, I really look forward to addressing here a little bit. So when you spoke about um, kind of the division mission of Singularity Net in a different interview I heard, you know, you mentioned that Singular Narrative has these two objectives. Uh, first is the objective of maximizing intelligence. The other one, this objective of kind of uh, pursuit the maximum benefit for all beings. I'm curious. So, you know, we spoke a little bit now about, okay, how do you evaluate an AI? And, you know, how can you check whether what, what they're doing is correct, is in your interest? So I, now I, I understand also the concept of creating this efficient marketplace for AI. And so now I, as a normal small business owner, I can kind of use AI and maybe have something almost as good as Google and I don't trust them fully, or maybe something better than Google right down the line. But like, how can you, how can you make sure that this system is going to end up being a system that pursues this, you know, benefit for all beings and, that kind of embodies this this value well we can't make sure of anything and i would say if if we don't create singularity net if i decide to go do something more relaxing with my life instead then how do you know for sure that you know xi jinping vladimir putin donald trump uh google ibm tencent uh all the companies out there. How do you, how are you sure that those guys are going to create an AI which is for broad human benefit? And if everyone stops making AI, how do you guarantee that no one's going to like send synthetic viruses out there to poison everyone to death, right? So, uh, or that the proliferation of nuclear material in the you know Eastern Europe isn't going to be used to blow everybody up. So, I mean, I think we're not in a point in human history. Well, there's a great amount of, of certainty. There's probably even more uncertainty than in the past, and 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 there there's there's always been a lot. So, but really, the the question to ask is, on average, are we better off creating a, a decentralized, you know, benefit oriented AI platform like Singularity Net, or well, are we better well, off? I, I mean, my not, question not having that there and and having all the other shit going on in the world, right? I mean, that that that's that that's the question. That's the question to ask. So, so yeah, we, I mean that's a fair point. But then I, I I mean that's just sort of rephrasing the question a little bit. So then I guess my question is, well, what are you doing in order such that you know this objective is and this value is embodied in the platform? Yeah, I mean there there's two parts of that. So what one part is in sort of the tokenomics of the singularity in the ecosystem, and the other part is in the AIs that the Singularity Net Foundation itself is are, are, are building and putting into the network. So, I mean, in, in terms of the 
tokenomics. I mean, there's curation markets and an intelligent reputation system, which, which is designed so that at least the agents that are contributing value to the network are getting rewarded proportionally to that instead of having sort of game, game theoretic dynamics where a few agents will accumulate all wealth, which is what seems to be happening in Bitcoin and Ethereum and is what happens in most conventional economies also. And then on top of that, a certain percentage of the tokens that were initially minted are earmarked to be spent on benefit tasks as decided by the community, which can be things like healthcare, education, me medicine, and, and so forth. So there, there's at least that nudge put in there to have a certain percentage of the tokens spent on, on things that are considered of, of, of broad benefit. I mean, and this is, this is much like a government does when it, when it spends some percentage of its wealth on, on social welfare, right? It's just most, most projects don't like wire that into their, their economic operation. But then the, the AIs that we are putting into the network ourselves are largely benefit oriented. So, Sophia Robot, which we talked about, one thing we've been doing is using Sophia as a like a therapist and meditation assistant. So that's, you know, that's not solving all the problems of the world, but it's different than the Terminator, right? I mean, it, it's using a robot to sort of help people expand their consciousness. And we, we're, we're, we're working on applying AI that's using the OpenCog framework and wrapped in SingularityNet to analyze DNA data of people living 105 years or over to figure out what makes them live so long, to try to figure out how to extend other people's lives. We're analyzing images of plants from China and Africa to try to diagnose spread of crop disease in early stages using, using deep neural nets for image processing. So, of course, each of these things is a drop in the bucket regarding what we need to do to massively improve the state of humanity. But the, the, the hope is that by injecting these things in the network at, at an early stage, you're impacting the culture of the community. Because ultimately, this is about the community that, that you build around SingularityNet. So if, if through curation rewards and, and benefit tokens and having a bunch of you know, positive, beneficial stuff happening in the network, and then you know, our largest... Our largest development office is in Ethiopia, in, in Addis Ababa, where we have 20-something uh, developers working on, on SingularityNet. So we're, we're trying to actively pull people from the developing world into development and, and use the network. So hopefully by all these things, we'll be nudging the community in a, in a positive direction, which is really going to be the most important thing. Because, I mean, if, if we're successful with this, then... You know, five years from now, the work done by SingularityNet Foundation will be a relatively modest percentage of all the work being done to build the protocol on the network over time. And the AIs in the network will be mostly contributed by, you know, other random people, not, not by people paid by SingularityNet Foundation. But then we are seeding this community and, and we're seeding this culture. Like you can see that in Linux, right? Like... Linus Torvalds and Richard Stallman and their friends from the old days write a very small percent of code in Linux right now, but the culture of Linux is what it is because of, 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 how, of how they started it, right? So we, we want to get you know, beneficial motives and love and compassion and inclusiveness in the cultural DNA of, of singularity in the community, and then it will continue to be there in, in, in the code also. And this is a bit you know, soft and, and fuzzy. It, it's not like a mathematical guarantee of beneficial activity, but I, I think that's, that's how things actually, actually have to work. Because in the end, it's about the community of human beings who are going to be developing, developing this on, ongoingly. Well, that's, that's really fascinating. And, uh, and uh, I think also the fact that you guys have, have actual people in Ethiopia working on problems in Ethiopia is... Is really is great and I, uh, uh, far far removed from uh, what a lot of people in the blockchain space are are doing in this. Yeah, in this although you know, Car Cardano Cardano is running a like a year long 
education program where they're teaching a hundred young Ethiopian programmers Haskell. That's cool. The programming language. So I, I think while I've been I've had this office in Ethiopia since what twenty fourteen, I guess, doing AI outsourcing before we shifted them to Singularity Net. But now Cardano's moved in there and yeah, there's a lot of tech projects throughout various African tech hubs now. So there's powerful forces of you know centralization and wealth concentration, but but yet there's there's also the the opposite and that peer to peer and, and positive globalization happening. So it's a very interesting time where these two different forces are both both surging forward in, in powerful ways. Cool. So before we wrap up, I, I didn't want to ask you one one last question. Uh, and this is we, we kind of touched on this earlier when you were talking about uh, AIs making predictions. So but let's imagine a future now where uh, you know a lot of a lot of the economy is is run on blockchain systems. So you have you know powerful markets that that exist exclusively on blockchains, and organizations and companies are interacting with these markets on blockchains, doing business on these markets, and these mar these markets are run by DAOs. So uh, there are there are governance mechanisms in place which uh, allow the companies that themselves that are you know, operating on these markets to participate also in the governance through through staking. Okay, so you know the companies that use the markets also have stake on the markets and they can par participate in governance decisions for like protocol updates or things like this. Now, it, it seems like there would be an incentive at this point, uh, and, and even for something like prediction markets, for these companies who have stake to essentially delegate their stake to an AI because then AI is going to make much better decisions on what types of governance uh, or what types of proposals that they should be making in order to maximize the network uh, itself and also sort of like maximize their profits uh, long term. So it, it seems like there would be kind of a like a Nash equilibrium here where at, at, at some point, you know, if one company starts using an AI to manage their governance or to make predictions and other companies start using AIs to make predictions. And then when everybody's making predictions or making governance decisions with an AI, and as we move closer to general AI, then it's like, then you just have AIs competing with AIs. And I, I, I guess this also extends you know, more I mean, broadly outside of the blockchain who, space, but how do you I mean, see that Who's, who's in charge now? Who's in charge of the world now? No, but nobody's in charge, right? Um, which, uh, in some ways, it's good when you have presidents like Donald Trump out there, right? It, 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 it's good that it's the whole collective self-organizing dynamic that's in charge rather than any, any one person. And who's in charge of Bitcoin and Ethereum? Yeah, we don't, we don't, we don't actually know that, but it's clear it's concentrated in a small, a small number of individuals and, and in, in, in investment groups who, who, are, who are controlling these things. So, yeah, I, I think... You know, in the long term, it's inevitable that, you know, if AIs are a thousand times more intelligent than human beings and have molecular nanotechnology and so forth, it, it, it's, it's inevitable they're going to have more physical power than, than humans, right? I mean, it doesn't mean they're going to control every little aspect of what humans do in their lives, but they're, they're, they're going to have more, more oomph than we do, right? So, I mean, it, in the long term, which may just be like decades from now, we're going to have two choices. One is like you, you wire into the network and uh, become, become one with a super intelligent global brain, even if that means giving up many aspects of your legacy humanity, or else, you know, you live in the, in the people preserve, like the squirrels in the national, in the national park. And, you know, the, the squirrels, the squirrels in the park, they can fight over girlfriends and hunt for food and play and have fun. And people are not, trying to regulate every aspect of their little squirrel existence, right? On the other hand, if they run out of the park, they might get rolled over by a truck, right? So, I mean, I think if you have a superhuman AI that's tremendously more intelligent than us, either you join it or you're going to remain living a happy human life, hopefully, with a lot of abundance provided for you. But, I mean, in, in, in the end, there's something much more powerful than you that does have some regulatory control when it when it needs to which could be good also right like if if the squirrels die of some plague we'll come in and give them antibiotics right and 
the same way if human society went too far awry, a super AI that loved us, it would let us go about our business, but if things went too far awry, it might come in and, and fix things. So, I mean, that's, that's a long term. It's upload to the global brain or live in the people preserve, right? But, I mean, in the, in the medium term, it's going to be really, really complicated. And, the, and as you say, there's going to be a gradual transition from human decision-making to AI decision-making. But given, given how profoundly fucked so much of our political and corporate ecosystem is now, I see that as a great opportunity to, to improve things, right? I mean, there, there's a lot of... If the AI is written right, it's going to do a lot better than the individual humans and institutions that are controlling things now. So then it really comes down to, you know, creating the AIs that are going to be the, the decision support systems for the, the people controlling most of the world's, most of the world's resources. So yeah. let's I'm, make... glad that, I'm glad that I can always go back to the, to the, to the human uh, reserve, uh, nature reserve, wherever that is, so I can, I can chase whatever whatever things you would chase these Loose. days without any encumbrance. Yeah, yeah, we're, 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 set, we're setting aside a, reg, a region in uh, southern Ethiopia for this purpose. So, yeah, I'll, I'll show it to you some time. Or maybe Antarctica, when, when the world... When the world yeah, uh, yeah, after some, some, global, after some global, global warming. Like, yeah. uh, unconnected humans. <laughs> uh, so let, let's, before we wrap up, let's just, I just want to ask you, you know, how, how can people get involved in, in Singularity Net and where they can learn more? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, the... Center of it all, go to the website, singularitynet.io. And I mean, th there you can find information on how to download and play with the, with the beta. If you're, if you're a developer or we have a, a blog, which has updates on our research uh, pretty frequently. We have a Telegram discussion group, which has uh, some percentage of interesting things on it and, and some other things. And so I, 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 th I think uh, lots, of, lots of ways to get involved with the with the community and uh, you know, I'm still, as well as doing some actual work, going around and speaking at, at various conferences. So I can meet, meet some, of, uh, some of you guys uh, listening there. I think in middle of March, uh, we're having Token 2049 conference here, here in Hong Kong. So if, if anyone's there, we can, uh, we, can, we can hang out. But uh, yeah, this is all, in the end, while we're talking about building superhuman AI, Getting there is all about the human community, right? So we need people to be involved in, in many, many different ways. So jo yeah, join our communities online, and that uh, and, uh, we're happy to talk to you about, about what you can do to help out. Great. Well, Ben, thank you so much for joining us. It was a real pleasure talking and, uh, great. and, and, and diving deep in this, in this really fascinating topic that we don't really always get, a, get much chance to discuss here on the podcast. So uh, happy to have you on. Cool. Uh, good fun. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, SoundCloud, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have a Google Home or Alexa device, you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Epicenter podcast. Go to epicenter.tv slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for the newsletter so you get new episodes in your inbox as they're released. If you want to interact with us, the guests or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter and please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show and we're always happy to read them. So thanks so much and we look forward to being back next week.